Okay. Uh, hi, I'm going to talk about knowledge graph construction. And the goals of this talk on a high level are converting noisy text into useful knowledge. And when you think of noisy text, you might think about the internet, um, which is full of all sorts of information, but uh, you wouldn't quite call it knowledge. It's very hard to take that text and create you know, a mental model of what we consider knowledge. So um, the, the overview of the talk is that we're going to talk about the, the state of the art in information extraction, which is the field which takes text and extracts um, sort of structured information from it. And then we'll talk Actually, about. Out of curiosity, there is an um, information extraction class happening this quarter. Is anybody um, taking it? Okay, so John, you're in charge of um, giving feedback and making connections. <laughs> and once you get to information uh, through information extraction, this little whirlwind tour, getting you kind of um, situated with what people in the information extraction community do, we'll talk about knowledge graphs and how um, you know, the, the topics in this class in statistical relational learning in general can be used to build um, sort of better structured knowledge representations. And since Steve kindly told us all about PSL, we'll look at a PSL model in action here and do a little demo of um, running this model uh, on information extracted from the web and creating a knowledge graph from it. So um, there'll be a focus on tools and data sets. So in case you want to you know, get a head start on brainstorming for this class project, it'll give you some resources that you can look at. Okay, so sort of the big question we want to ask you know, as machine learners is, can we have computers that create knowledge? And so, as I said, what we have uh, access to is the internet, this huge um, you know, resource of publicly available information. And it's possible that what, you, know, you could extract lots of useful knowledge from the internet, um, but we're not really sure how. And so the, the goal of the talk is to, to kind of help you understand how we're doing, you know, how we're going from something like the internet to useful knowledge. And so, you know, as savvy net users, you're probably aware that there's this growing movement that that is producing knowledge. So if you look at some of the things on this uh, the slide, you type in giants and you know Google knows to give you the latest sports scores, and you ask your phone you know, what type of uh, Pokemon is Pikachu, and it gives you this structured output that gives you a lot of information uh, as well as the answer. Um, and finally, you know, you can even type it to Facebook, some, you know, a relational query which understands not just the people you know, but how you know them and what type of uh, information that they have posted on Facebook. So there's this sort of structured information available to us already, and we kind of want to formalize uh, the, the process of creating it. So you know, you might be asking, what does it mean to create knowledge, or what do we even mean by knowledge? These are sort of deep philosophical questions you might have when somebody starts talking about knowledge. Um, and we probably won't talk too deeply about that, but let, let's define the questions that we're going to, to ask. So one question is, given text, how can we extract useful knowledge? And part of extracting useful knowledge is asking, how do we represent knowledge? And finally, if we have a representation, how can we extend you know, what we know through reasoning and inference. Okay, so these are sort of the three areas that we're going to consider in this talk. Um, so here's a, an example of some text you might see. This is um, probably a, about a week or two old, um, just taken from a, an AP News story. And uh, take 30 seconds to read it. Look how rich this text is. So um, I'm not going to read it out loud to you. When you're done reading, raise your hand. OK. I'm going to say everyone, even those who are not raising their hands. OK. So you probably get the gist of this, but look how complicated this is. So let's, you know, let's ask the question, um, what can we extract from some text like this? So the first thing we might want to do is find the entities. The entities are um, per, uh, you know, people, places, location, or people, locations, um, objects. Uh, uh, and you might have a proper noun, you know, the internal revenue 
service, for example, you might have a common noun which actually is a referent to that proper noun, like head is a referent to, uh, you know, an actual person here. So, you know, let's go through and everybody name their, their favorite entity. <laughs> go around the, we can go around the room. Service. Okay. Yes. Good. I like Daryl Good. Good. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Taxes of status. Yep. Congressional panel. Okay. What about some some pronouns or common nouns? We'll consider these. Uh, these aren't named entities necessarily, but since we're hitting the bottom of the barrel. Commons, bonds, Did we do the IRS chief? Uh, no, I don't think anyone said that. Good. So I feel like you, you guys did uh, you did pretty well. Here, here are this is a subset of them I think as well. But you know, look at how many named entities we found here. Um, and some of these are you know, some of these are very clear, and some of them are kind of uh, ambiguous. Like the seldom used authority is you know being held in contempt, and this is kind of a very complex concept, uh, and it might be difficult for us to really you know, even, even humans to really say what all these uh, entities or, you know, the, the, the actors are. Um, so, you know, we can look at all of these entities and now we need to make sense of them. And so to make sense of these entities, we, we, what we want to do is kind of uh, figure out which of them refer to the same thing. So, um, you know, uh, those of you who are really excited, some, somebody volunteer and tell me, you know, three things that refer to the same thing. In this list, which you are primed for, since you've already named a lot of entities. John Good. So John Koskinen is the IRS chief. Chairman. Yeah, Chairman and Daryl Issa are the same person. So you know, this is this is the problem of entity resolution. So you have all of these entities that you extract from text, and now you want to resolve them to uh, you know cluster them into a set of terms which all refer to the same entity. So you can see here is a subset of uh, entities that we've resolved into uh, clusters, and these clusters refer to the principal actors in this article. Okay. So does everyone understand what happened here? Okay. So the next thing we might want to do is we have these entities that we resolved, uh, you know, all these mentions which we've resolved into entities, and now we want to understand, you know, who are these entities. So the problem of entity linking is taking these entities that we've resolved and linking them to a, a real-world entity that we know. Um, and so some, in some cases it's easy, in some cases it's hard. Um, you know, Daryl Issa, I'm using the Wikipedia pages as proxies for our understanding of this entity. Um, you know, you can look up his Wikipedia page. But if you look up, John, well, if you look up Kuskinen, um, there, there are actually quite a few Kuskinens. It's apparently a, a common... Uh, Finnish surname, uh, and so, meaning small rapids, if you didn't know. And John Kiskinen, our, our IRS commissioner, is in fact, or was previously the president of the U.S. Soccer Foundation. So, you know, this is also pretty, you know, you might not expect that the IRS commissioner was once the president of the Soccer Foundation, but, um, you know, th this is sort of how complex entities are um, and how, you know, how ambiguous sometimes the, the roles people play are. So, um, you may have to disambiguate which skin in uh, you really mean when you're looking at entities. So now we, we understand entities, but you know we, we want knowledge. So let's let's look at extracting some answers from text. So here are some questions we could ask. You could imagine you know your your standardized testing where you get a series of questions like this and you have to bubble in the right answer. Um, so you know we might ask who is the head of the IRS? You know who. Uh, who is the who chairs the House Oversight and Reform Committee? You know who, who leads these uh, organizations. You know the something's being subpoenaed by someone. You know who is 
subpoenaing what, um, even which Wednesday did this take place? Um, how do the House Republicans relate to Congress in the, the real world? Um, so there's this rich set of questions we could ask even from this short article. Uh, and so the way information extraction community, the information extraction community has approached this uh, is that they've created a series of different extraction systems. Um, and we'll talk about one of them right now. So one really simple extraction pattern or extraction system is just to look for patterns. So if you want to know um, who leads a certain organization, you could look for blank chief blank. So you could see IRS chief John Kiskinen. Um, you could imagine on the internet you'd see lots of these. Um, you could also see uh, blank chairman blank, right? So you could think of a, a term which indicates leadership and then use these sort of blanks that you could fill in to, to decide who leads what. Um, and so we might be able to answer you know, the questions, who is the head of the IRS, who chairs the House Oversight and Reform Committee, using these sort of simple patterns. And similarly, you could think of um, the, this question of how, does, uh, how do the House Republicans relate to Congress with you know, blank one of blank. Um, so whatever the first term is, is a subset of the second term. So the House Government Oversight and Reform Committee is one of um, several congressional panels. And we could even think of association. So, you know, we want to know which state does uh, Daryl Issa represent. And you can see how the comma here is used to just indicate, um, to, to indicate an association. And you could think of, you know, Lisa Gator, you know, associate dean. Um, <laughs> And you, now you would know something about um, the association Lisa has, right? So this is very simple. And you, you could, in your mind, you, you were probably thinking, well, this could be really noisy. This could be very difficult to do. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very powerful. You could extract many such patterns from the internet. So um, it's sort of a double-edged sword. You get a lot of information, but some of it may be um, ambiguous. So now we've talked about answers that we can extract. but you know, it's, it's hard, you know, looking at this to, to actually have a convenient representation. So, you know, books, many books have been written about knowledge representation, but, you know, the one very simple way in which people represent knowledge is defining predicates at a high level um, and then populating them with you know, real-world entities. So instead of having, um, you know, every possible type of leadership position, we've taken you know, organization led by person. And, you know, lead could mean that you're the president, the chairman, you know, part of a, um, a governing board. And we're not making those distinctions here. We're looking at a very high level, uh, the relationship between the organization and the person. Um, similarly for subsets. So, you know, there are a lot of different subset relationships, but you could just say subpart of organization and generalize across many different organizations these subpart, subpart relationships. Um, and then we have some more specific uh, predicates that we've defined for the political, uh, you know, uh, or I guess the political uh, domain. So politician member of group, uh, holding office, location represented by politicians. So these are perhaps more specific to a particular application. So we have this nice representation of predicates that we can generalize across a lot of uh, text. And um, it's a little bit difficult to understand. And um, you know, it doesn't really give us an intuition necessarily of how we might work with it. So let's look at a representation of this, of this particular um, particular uh, set of predicates. So this is the knowledge graph representation. And you can see the red squares are entities. So these are the named entities we've extracted. Um, and here you, you see one name, but they might actually include all of the reference of that name in the article. Um, and edges between the entities indicate the relationships they have. So, you know, Daryl Issa holds the office of representative, uh, and he's a member of the House Oversight and Reform Committee. Okay. And then finally, we have these blue circles, which are actually uh, attributes or labels that we can assign to an entity. And we're showing them as sort of nodes here, but they're sort of closer to classes that you might apply um, or you know, uh, more of like a classification problem. Um, these are defined sort of at, at a, a knowledge base wide level. Okay. And so 
using this rep representation, we're emphasizing this relational structure between the entities uh, and the, the the classes. And so, as you know, Lisa is probably you know Lisa is probably motivated. This is a class about um, using relational structure as part of our machine learning. And so, this is this knobs graph representation sort of gives you some intuition of how you might uh, start using the SRL techniques that are being presented in this class uh, for this problem. So I have a few examples of real systems and uh, information extraction resources just to get you started with, um, with this area. So uh, the first is NLP toolkits. And these toolkits do sort of what we were doing in class, where you're picking out named entities, looking for relations between them. Um, so the, these are three very popular toolkits. One is the uh, the Stanford uh, Language Processing Toolkit. The second is the uh, National uh, Language Toolkit for Python. And the last is uh, OpenNLP from Apache. And as I said, they, they do all of these sort of basic um, information extraction and NLP tasks, uh, such as parsing part of speech, tagging, uh, name entity recognition, some co-reference resolution, and text. And so if you want to start from the raw text, these are some resources that you can use. Um, the second type of data or second uh, set of resources that I want to mention are um, knowledge bases and information extraction systems in the wild. So there's actually a very different set of philosophies across um, across in the information extraction community. So if you look at Yago, this is a, a project at uh, the Max Planck Institute, and they're extracting their knowledge base from structured text like Wikipedia and Wikipedia in info boxes. And so, you know, we all go to Wikipedia probably when we have a, you know, it's one of our the first resources that we consult when we have a factual question. So it's a, a very useful and clean data set, um, and so they're able to extract, um, you know, some some very clean information. But of course, they're sort of restricted to what Wikipedia has, and the the set of relationships they have is actually um, somewhat small, just because the Wikipedia info boxes are, are um, kind of constrained. And they've extended to go past the info box, but um, a lot of it is this. Um, info box sort of uh, focused extraction, and that knowledge base um, has about a uh, 120 million facts. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by info box? So you know when you query Wikipedia, there's like the picture, and then below it there's some structured information in a, a little gray okay. back box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the so you know this is restrictive set of relations, uh, clean set of text. Uh, and high quality knowledge base um, as a result of these restrictions. Um, the second uh, knowledge base that we're going to talk about. Sorry. Are those the number of relations we're talking about? Yeah, or some relations and categories, I think. What's the WordNet? WordNet is a sort of a kind of like a semantic dictionary which has which defines categories and their sort of nesting behavior, sort of an ontological um, uh, layer on top of a dictionary. Um, Do all these resources provide like RDF compilations of your? It's not necessarily RDF, but they they certainly have data that you can um, that you can download, and it's not too hard to put in an RDF form. Um, okay. So, okay. the The next uh, knowledge base we're going to talk about is Nell. And so Nell is slightly different because it's extracting from unstructured web pages. So basically, the the sort of stuff that when you're surfing around the net, you see those types of news articles or um, you know hobby pages. And so it's it's very noisy data, and they've defined um, thousands of relations and categories. So you know the, the when we see like led by, member of, they've de defined these types of relations. They've they've defined categories such as you know male organization. Um, you know, political office, and so now they they have a an ontology which they can use to map the text they're reading uh, to a set of predicates, and so um, this this is a fairly large knowledge base as well, 50 million um, extractions, um, and they fall into these predefined relations and categories, um, and then the last uh, knowledge knowledge base I'm going to discuss is part of this open information extraction movement. And they have no predefined relations or categories. What they use is text that they find as, a, as relating to entities uh, or 
text that they find is a, a categorical label for uh, entities. So you might you can imagine that it, there's potentially millions of relations that they find, and then they send they go after the fact. They've tried to collapse some of these um, relations and categories into clusters that mean the same thing. So this data set is far richer, but also harder to work with. It has more nuanced meanings, but at the same time, it might be difficult to understand um, what each, you know, how, how all of these different relations relate. So this is a massive, the, I think the raw data is 5 billion extractions, and then they have a cleaner set of 15 million extractions that's uh, a little easier to use. So as you can see, there, there's this spectrum of how people approach this problem. Yes? So are you aware of this uh, IBM tool for... Uh, I've been hearing about it in relation to this IE class. Okay. I'm just wondering how it relates to the other products. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, the, you know, the, they're, they're actually far more information extraction systems and knowledge bases, which I'm not mentioning. Um, and some of them are very domain specific. I think this is just what you would start with if if you're kind of interested in getting to know uh, the field. I mean, based on my <laughs> experience, these are sort of the mainstream ones that people talk about. Um, and then they're the ones that industry does, and then they're the domain specific ones. So I, you know, I, I think if if you ask someone like what is the most popular you know information extraction system or KB, you probably get a lot of these. I don't know. And some of it does come from you know the different communities that are doing them. I think these are coming more from um, AI, natural language processing, information extraction. Um, and from universities versus, you know, the tools that are coming out of industry like JSET. Okay. So, we've, you know, I, I just showed you this slide with all of the knowledge bases. So is the problem solved? You know, we can create these beautiful knowledge graphs. Life is good, right? Um, and the problem we're facing is that you can think of each document, even that small snippet we saw, as this world of information. And it's very easy with the, at the document, well, not very easy, but it's, it's tractable at the document level to do a lot of these tasks. And there's been a lot of emphasis on doing these tasks at the document level. But really what we have when we think about the internet is sort of a universe. And that world is that pale blue dot, you know, in, in, in that tiny speck across all of the different documents that you have in the the universe. So can we build knowledge bases that are across documents, across potentially millions of documents, and resolve which relationships and entities and uh, you know, labels exist you know, in truth, not just at a document level? So this is the challenge that, you know, the, the sort of the new frontier that a lot of the, the knowledge creation work is starting to consider. And so what we have is a revised problem. So we have the, this massive source of publicly available information. We have these cutting edge information extraction methods that decades of work have, have honed. And now we can produce uh, a structured representation of knowledge. And we can even represent it as a knowledge graph. Um, and you know, we looked at this slide of knowledge graphs in the wild, but you can sort of see some problems. So for example, you typed in giants and the scores are for a football game. But if you look at the news, the news is about a baseball game, and even one of the images is about the San Francisco Giants, which is a baseball team. So there's sort of an inconsistency at the entity level about which of these uh, teams it's actually representing. And if you ask your phone, I mean, this might be an ill-post query, but you say Mount Everest, and Siri realizes it's a place, but it doesn't really give you that much information about Mount Everest. So you know, e even at the query level, trying to understand what uh, a user might be trying to to grasp about an uh, about a query is is um, sort of uncertain. So, what we want to do is sort of think about the challenges here. The internet is very noisy. The extraction task can be very difficult. Um, and when you produce a knowledge graph using just the extracted 
uh, outputs, you might have many errors and inconsistencies because of the difficulty of the task. Um, and we're going to look at a, a sort of a case study of this. So um, I mentioned Nell just a few slides ago. Uh, it's this very large-scale information extraction project. And what, the way it works is that every day it reads the web corpus and extracts facts. And then it uses those extractions to learn more patterns to improve its extractors and then re the next day read the same web pages again and try to extract more, um, potentially also querying the web uh, to get additional information. And it has this ontology, as I said, of thousands of known labels and relations and millions of facts. And if you're interested, you can actually follow CMU Nell on Twitter, and every day it'll tweet some things that it's learned reading the internet that day, um, which, if you did, might not be as exciting, but this is a machine, so uh, pretty great. And if you look on the right there, this is a small subset of the ontology, so you can see um, all of the different kinds of labels it can give a person, you know, everything from monarch and astronaut to chef. Okay, so let's look at errors that Nell makes. So um, most of you, I guess, if you've done your QCRs, you've probably read the paper, and you're probably familiar with some of these examples. So if you think of the country Kyrgyzstan, Nell believes that there are actually many locations, each of them spelled slightly differently or uh, having variants of the, the name Kyrgyzstan. And it has facts for each of these locations. So, you know, of all of these, uh, of these five misspellings of Kyrgyzstan, um, you know, they, they're all, in truth, referring to the same place, uh, but until we resolve these co-references, we can't sort of see that they're all, uh, all about the same thing. Um, the second problem we have are missing or spurious labels. So uh, Nell believes that Kyrgyzstan is both a bird and a country. And the reason Nell thinks Kyrgyzstan is a bird is because there's a web page where everybody posts pictures of birds, uh, and a link is generally a link with a, where the text is the, the name of a bird. And then one person decided to post um, you know, pictures from countries that they visited. And on most of the page, it's, a good, it's, a, it's fairly reasonable to assume that a link is the name of a bird, but in this one snippet of text, um, the name actually means that it's, the name is actually the name of a country. So now we've mislabeled you know, Kyrgyzstan as a country, or uh, as, a, as a bird. And the last type of error you see are missing and spurious relations. So Kyrgyzstan's location is ambiguous um, based on some of these patterns that it's using. So Nell believes it could be in Russia, it could be in the US, it could be in Kazakhstan. Um, and we believe, you know, countries should only be in continents, but without some enforcement of that rule, you could say a country is located in another country. Okay. So as I've been motivating, these are all violations of a certain type of ontological knowledge. So in the first case, we saw that you know, the different variants of Kyrgyzstan are actually co-referent to the same entity. So if we had, and this is in um, sort of ontological terms, the same as relationship. So really what we want is the structured uh, ontological knowledge that Kyrgyzstan and the Kyrgyz Republic are the same entity. Um, the second example where we had labels that were inconsistent, we actually know that the labels bird and country are, are mutually exclusive. They're disjoint sets. And so you could represent that ontological knowledge as a mutual exclusion between the labels bird and country. And finally, uh, as I said, we know that countries are located on continents. So we can look at selectional preferences such as the domain of a relation and the range of a relation to uh, to narrow down the labels that the, uh, the subject and the object have in that relation. Um, and we can also use information about labels to better understand which relations uh, exist or don't exist. And so the problem in all of these cases that to, is that to enforce these constraints, you have to operate jointly over, the, you know, over all of the extractions across all of the documents. And so this sort of cross-document uh, inference is actually a very difficult challenge. You know, think about how much you can extract from one document, now multiply it by millions of documents. And so we have some evidence that joint models have succeeded. Um, there, here are some resources when you get the slides. If you're interested, you can look at some of these papers where they've done really cool uh, applications where they've taken a joint model and shown improvements over sort of an independent approach. We're going to talk about the, the last point here, graph identification. Um, and this is what 
my work on knowledge graph identification is based off of. So the problem we have is we have an we we observe an input graph and that input graph is maybe easy to get but it's not actually that useful for analysis. And what we want to do is identify the the output graph which is structured in a way that's amenable to analysis. So to give you a concrete example, you might observe a communication network. So you see emails between different senders and recipients. Uh, and what you want to actually infer is an organizational network. Uh, who are the people in this company? How, what are the management relationships they have? What are their positions in this company? And so graph identification takes an input graph, such as an email graph, and uh, produces an output graph, such as the social network or organizational structure. And you can see in both of these graphs, actually, this is a previous slide, that the nodes, the edges, and the attributes are actually very different. In the first graph, the nodes are email addresses, and in the, the output graph, the nodes are people. In the input graph, the edges are emails uh, between uh, different, different email addresses, and in the second, the edges are management relationships between people. And in the first graph, the attributes are just the words in the email, um, and in the output graph, the attributes are actually the title the person has in this organization. So you can see how one graph might not be that useful, but the second graph is very has con contains a lot of knowledge which is useful. Um, so how do we do this? You know, this sounds great. How do we do graph identification? So you'll see this maps actually nicely to the, the problems we saw. The first problem is entity resolution. So you have this email communication network, and you have to find which emails map to which person. And that problem is the entity resolution problem. So you might see that uh, N. Smith and Neil, uh, both of those email addresses are Neil Smith in this organization. Similarly, M. Jones and Mary are Mary Jones. Um, and you can do this for the, the remainder of the email addresses and come up with the set of entities. Um, the second problem is link prediction. So we have edges between email communication, and really what we want are edges between uh, management edges between people. So um, you can look at emails between uh, Neil Smith and Mary Jones and decide that they email a lot. Neil Smith might manage Mary Jones, um, and that Mary Taylor might manage Robert Lee, um, and sort of fill in these management links using the email features. And finally, we want to label the nodes. So what position does each, um, each person have in this organization? Well, you know, if Neil Smith sends an email to Robert Lee with, you know, a bunch of uh, review feedback or Mary Taylor assigns Ann Cole a bunch of tasks, we could use those words to understand that uh, Mary Taylor and Neil Smith might be higher in the organizational chart and Robert Lee and uh, Anna Cole might be their respective subordinates. So we can you know, assign uh, Mary Taylor as a, as a manager, Neil Smith as the CEO, and subsequently assign the remainder of the uh, people in the network labels. But the problem is that this is, uh, uh, you know, it's not so simple to do all of this. There are actually lots of rich dependencies. So we have these three tasks, entity resolution, uh, link prediction, and node labeling. And if you do them in isolation, we might get um, reasonable results, but the real problem that we're thinking about is actually very uh, interdependent. So clearly all of these are dependent on the input, the evidence that we see in the communication graph. And you know, you could have a simple classifier like a SVM or a Naive Bayes that could just extract a bunch of features and make these predictions just based on you know, email addresses or words. But even within each, um, each of these three tasks, there are interdependencies. So, um, when you resolve one set of entities, it might help you find another entity that's co-referent, or it might help you understand that that entity is not co-referent. Uh, when you label somebody a CEO, you might understand that there's only one CEO in an organization, so other people cannot also be the CEO. Um, and you know, if one person manages another, that that link is not likely to be reflexive. So these are sort of mutually exclusive links that you would see. Um, and finally, there are dependencies across these tasks. Once you've resolved entities, that might help you decide who the manager or CEO is. Or, um, and once you uh, come through with a set of uh, management links, that will also give you some idea of who the CEO is. So there's this rich ecosystem of dependencies that we really need to consider when we solve these types of problems. Um, so when we look at knowledge graph identification, we'll see. 
cause, especially to let you take a breath. Um, uh, so do in this class, you know, be thinking of other problems that have this characteristic. Um, so, you know, we can all relate to emails and social networks, and there's a lot of other kind of social networking things that have this aspect. Um, but there's lots of other domains that things like this um, happen in. So um, I'm really interested in collecting examples of these. So have it. be on the lookout for them. You can think of them in computer vision for sure, where you're trying to do teen understanding, relationships between things, um, uh, biological networks for sure, EC, this kind of thing happening. Um, Publications uh, where you're trying to make sense of either just the citation networks, or really literally bibliographic um, kinds of networks. And actually, this is a, a big industry, you know, doing this um, correctly, doing the bibliometrics to figure out co authors and teachers and citations. Um, but yeah, so I think I think this is really cool. Um, this is Galileo's slide, but it, it's a really neat slide just because it shows you how how complex you know this set of tasks is for this application, but how in machine learning we, we should think about the dependencies between sort of a, a complex set of problems that we're trying to solve. Um, yeah, so this introduces my work, which builds on graph identification um, for the the domain of knowledge graphs. So what we want to do is revise that problem that we came up with. So we're going to take the internet, we're going to do this large-scale, sophisticated information extraction, and what we're going to come up with is the extraction graph. And this is sort of the input graph that we saw in graph identification. And it's got, some, it's got noise, it's got inconsistencies, and so what we want to do is perform a, a set of joint reasoning to come up with the knowledge graph. And we're going to call this joint reasoning knowledge graph identification. So you can see the, the same pattern where we have an input graph, and we're going through a process to produce a consistent output graph. So in knowledge graph identification, we're doing sort of the core problems of graph identification, entity resolution, node labeling, and link prediction. But we're adding um, sort of a, a more sophisticated type of reasoning, which uses the ontological constraints that we've been seeing in um, through this, this presentation that help us resolve errors and inconsistencies. We're also going to incorporate uh, multiple uncertain sources, in this case, different extractors and documents that are producing the extraction graph. So each of them may have a different reliability, they may have a different sort of set of operating characteristics, and being able to leverage those characteristics in our resolution process will improve the quality of the knowledge graph. So to give you a high-level overview of what's happening, we start out with these uncertain extractions. And so these are the ones that correspond to our, uh, the example of from Nell, um, Kyrgyzstan being both a burdened country, um, the Kyrgyz Republic being labeled as a country, uh, a capital associated with the Kyrgyz Republic. And each of these has a confidence value uh, that Nell assigns based on the features it's collected. So you can see that each of them uh, has a varying degree of confidence based on the documents. And so this is uh, this gives us can be represented as an extraction graph. So this is the extraction graph that we can uh, we get from this set of extractions. You can see there's an inconsistency where Kyrgyzstan is labeled as both a bird and a country. And so what we'd like to do is uh, annotate a set of ontological relationships and um, entity resolution uh, onto the the knowledge graph and so or, or the extraction graph. And so here you can see we've annotated a mutual exclusion between the labels bird and country. And we've also uh, shown this domain relationship between the relation has capital and the the domain uh, the range country. Um, domain has country, and then we've added this result entity resolution link between the between the Kyrgyz Republic and Kyrgyzstan. And so this is sort of the the enriched problem that we face. And the goal is to come up with this consistent knowledge graph, which finds the co-referent entities, Kyrgyzstan and the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, understands that they have the capital Bishkek, um, and that it's labeled as country. So this is the overview of the process, but how do we build a model? So uh, I'm going to introduce a graphical model that shows you how we uh, approach this problem. So here are the variables in the graphical model. 
Um, each possible label and relationship is a, a variable here. So, you know, we have the labels for Kyrgyzstan and the Kyrgyz Republic of both bird and country, and we have the relationship between um, the Kyrgyz Republic and Bishkek. Um, so each of these variables is supported by evidence that we see in the extraction. So these purple boxes are extractions that the, the information extraction system has produced candidate facts to include in the knowledge graph. And a lot of approaches that perform sort of that view this as an independent problem will stop here. So these are all pieces of evidence, and you're going to make a prediction as to the truth value of each of these variables. And there's no dependencies included. Uh, and so what we want to do is introduce dependencies between these variables to, to improve the quality of the, the predictions. And so we can introduce the mutual exclusion dependency between the facts um, Kyrgyzstan is a country and Kyrgyzstan is a bird, likewise for the Kyrgyz Republic. We can introduce the domain relationship between uh, the Haas capital relation and the, the domain being country. And we can in introduce um, entity resolution and say that if Kyrgyzstan is a bird, then the Kyrgyz Republic is a bird. If Kyrgyzstan is a country, then the Kyrgyz Republic is a country. Um, if Kyrgyzstan's capital is Bishkek, so is the Kyrgyz Republic's. So now you can see, there's even in this really simple example, you, you see how many dependencies we've introduced between the variables. And you, you can imagine that now we can pool information across these extractions to better understand what's true and what's false. So I'm going to go quickly over some background on probabilistic soft logic. I know Steve gave a great talk on Thursday, but if, if you missed it or you just want a refresher, I'm going to reinforce what, what the important points are. So what PSL is, um, probabilistic soft logic, is this templating language for a class of models known as hinge loss Markov random fields. And one of its key benefits is, is that it's very scalable. Um, we're going to specify a model in terms of logical rules, and um, each each rule is sort of familiar to you if you're uh, if you're familiar with first order logic. But the difference between these rules and the rules you're used to is that the formulation is actually a soft logic formulation. Um, and in this slide, we've shown a tilde over the the connector to kind of give you a, a signal that that's happening. So the truth values are not going to be binary 0 or 1. They're actually going to be soft values in the interval 0 through 1. And we're going to derive a truth value for each formula based on the Lukasiewicz t, no t norm and co norm. And that's going to be sort of consistent with uh, you know, first order logic and the extremes where all of the variables um, take binary values, or all the atoms take binary values. But if you have um, soft values, it's going to give you a consistent interpretation between 0 and 1. So the, the model that PSL uses is this uh, exponential model. And so in this model, we're going to ground the rules, such as the one we saw on the last slide, by substituting in literals, such as Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, country. And so this is a, the, the rule you see here is a, a ground rule, and that ground rule uh, is actually specific to one extraction that we see in our data set. So for each ground rule, we, have, we define a weight, uh, which we, in this case, is WEL, but is the weight of how important that rule is to the model. And then we also define a distance to satisfaction. So how far are the assignments to the atoms in this rule uh, from truth? Yes. So, quick question about the rules. Mm -hmm. um, where did these come from? Is, uh, they appear to be uh, statically defined some knowledge base. Right. So, so I guess that there are a few levels. You know, uh, in machine learning you often create a model. And in this case, this is the model that we've chosen. Uh, there's this rich there's this, you know, rich community that the semantic web community has actually spent a lot of time thinking about ontologies and creating these ontologies for many domains. So we might have access to an ontology which has a rich set of relationships between you know, ontological knowledge. And then writing down the rules is pretty straightforward. We understand, based on how ontologies are created, the relationships they capture. So I think the, the modeling is straightforward, and in some cases, it depends on the ontology you're using and the richness of the ontology. Um, but they're generally like expert people. It's true. I, I mean, I think in, you know, it's hard to create a good model in machine learning if you know nothing about the domain you're trying to model. So I, I think it's reasonable to say that we, we, have, we have to think a little bit about the domain when we create a model. Um, and some of it is choosing the, the right tools, and some of it is choosing the right model. 
Um, some of it is choosing the right data and features. So I think these are all sort of the problems you have in machine learning. Yes? Um, the weight is the confidence? No, the, the confidence is actually, um, for example, in this case, label Kyrgyzstan country. Uh, that might be related to the, the confidence. But the weight is actually something that you either set or learn that tells you how important this rule is. So if this is a really bad rule, if the same entity is, is wrong a lot of the time, you don't want to give it a high weight. Uh, if it's right every time, you want to give it a very high weight. If the weight is just by month. Right. Um, and as I said, in some cases, you may just want to set that if you have no training data. In this case, we have training data, so we actually learn how good each of these rules are. And we'll, we'll look at that in the demo. Yes. What do you mean by grounding? So the grounding is just, you see the, the, the first formula here, the same end? The grounding has literals, right? If you look at the previous slide, um, it has like E1, E2, uh, L. These are variables. And we have to assign these variables to entities um, or, or literals in order for it to be ground. So you take these variables and you substitute in a particular value. In this case, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz Republic, uh, you know, country. And now this is a ground rule, a rule that has a particular set of values bound to the variables. OK? Um, and this is? Hmm? Yeah, and this happens like a bunch of different places in the model that we'll see. Um, and people use different language for it. But in general, it's the notion of, you know, you have a universal rule for all p of x implies q, for all x p of x implies q of x. And then you have a database that has a bunch of x's in it. And then you're going to, quote, quote, ground it out for each of the instances in the database. Right. Any other questions? Um, G and D just stand for graph and then evidence? Yeah, the, the G is the inferred graph, and E is the evidence, such as the extractions. Um, yeah, and that's sort of the last point, but it's not very clear, I guess. Um, right. So this is a joint probability distribution, and it's predicting the knowledge graph, or the probability of the knowledge graph, given a set of extractions, um, as well as sort of the ontological knowledge. OK. So, um, just, uh, just again, the, the weighted distance of satisfaction is a function of the truth value of this formula. So, um, you know, if, if this formula that we see that Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyz Republic are the same entity and Kyrgyzstan has the label country, uh, if the, the body is true um, and the, the head is true, then the distance to satisfaction is actually low. It's a true formula. Whereas if the uh, body is true and the head is false, then the distance to satisfaction is high because you really have to change the values to get this rule to be happy, as Steve put it last lecture. So, um, you know, the goal is to define, to, to determine the values of all of the facts in the knowledge graph such that all the rules are happy or satisfied. Okay. Um, and finally, just a quick review. So, um, oh, right. So what we get is a probability distribution. Um, sort of discuss this. Uh, and just a quick review. The what we the problem we face is finding the graph that maximizes that probability distribution, and that is the best knowledge graph. Um, and the reason we're using PSL is because the inference problem can actually be uh, solved through convex optimization. The, the form of the objective is convex. And this means it's very efficient. And the running time, empirically, uh, scales with the number of ground rules. Okay. So let's look at the rules that we're using in this model. So the first set of rules are fairly simple, what they do is relate an extraction from a particular uh, template or extractor type to the facts in the knowledge graph. So the facts in the knowledge graph are these, uh, the, the facts in the head. So, um, the, or, yeah, the head, the, the relation and the label are the facts that we include in the knowledge graph, but we don't observe them. What we observe are sort of noisy extractions from different uh, extractors. So T is the extractor type, and for each extractor type, uh, structural, pattern, table, we're going to create uh, a different predicate. And that predicate is going to include all of the, the candidates that that uh, type of extractor has, has found. And then we're going to give each of those extractors a weight, um, a separate weight for relations and labels um, that says how confident we are or how much we trust that particular extractor type. Okay. So does everyone understand these rules? Does anyone not understand these rules? 
it, it is kind of abstract just to, to mm. try and say it in multiple ways. Oftentimes we have this thing where we're getting this kind of noisy evidence and we're getting like a bunch of different sensors that are giving us noisy evidence and then we want to have these rules that say, okay, it gives you some um, evidence for the thing that you the thing that you want to infer in this case for the knowledge graph identification problem, whether there's a relation or whether there's a label, but you can also think of other problems where you, you know, want to combine together all this sensor data, experimental data, um, and you would have rules that might look like this. Uh, Just a quick question. Are we going to do any of these weights or are they? Uh, yeah, so in this application, we do learn the weights, and in the demo, I'll show you how that happens. Um, so, I, you know, it depends. If you have training data, you can learn weights. If you don't have training data, you're, you're kind of set using your intuition. Is the weight normalized? I, the weight learning algorithm will normalize the weights, no? It, it normalizes it across... Regular weights? So, so normalize in the sense that they are between 0 and 1? No, 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 they don't have to be. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. Yeah, if I set all the things to zero, we can object. Yeah, so, so um, the weights have to be non negative, uh, but that's the only requirement. Is it like a likelihood that the relation is false? Yeah, so there, there are parameters in, in the um, uh, distribution, but they're not, and so they control the likelihood, but you can't, but it's not that they are probabilities themselves, right? So you can think of it, uh, let's see, let's, um, kind of like the uh, precision in a Gaussian, you know, like the inverted uh, variance. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just uh, the higher it is, the more quickly uh, the, the function falls off, the more quickly the probability falls away, so you move away from satisfaction. So that means that it's more important to satisfy rules with higher weights. OK. You hmm. mentioned something about uh, sparse and regularization. Did you elaborate a little? So, I mean. <laughs> So in PSL, there are a number of different weight learning methods, and each of them has a different set of characteristics of you know, the, the weights it produces. And so you can trade off based on what mechanism you choose sparsity in. Because I can imagine there's a scenario where I have a bunch of hypothetical ontological data, and then I have this sparse data, and then I want to learn that this um, consistent sparse form, right? Mm -hmm. um, which and it summarizes uh, my domain in the most parsimonious way. Mm -hmm. so yeah, and so Steve has this neat paper on learning the weights, and they compare four different methods. And do you, do you actually? Great, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I just don't want to overstate it. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. So, so uh, one, uh, a common way to learn weights is with gradient descent. Um, and so you put an L1 regularizer on. The weights, uh, L1 regularizer, you take the L1 distance, it's just the absolute value of the weights, uh, and you want to uh, minimize that as part of your objective. And so uh, an L1 as opposed to an L2, which uh, squares the distance, um, or uh, squares the value of the weights, uh, is, is uh, sorry, I'm just kidding. So, so an L1 regularizer compared to, say, an L2 regularizer or no regularizer will induce sparsity. So that's a standard learning thing. And the take message messages, that's in PSL. Yes, yeah, it's a parameter that you can say you turn out that one regular message very easily. Right. OK. Um, so let's go on to the entity resolution rules. Uh, this is the one that we saw in the example in PSL. So this is saying if E1 and E2 are the same entity and E1 has label L, then E2 should have label L. Um, Similarly, if E1 and E2 are the same entity and E1 is related to some uh, target E by relation R, then E2 should also be related to E via R. Okay, so, um, and we, we flip the domain and range if the relation, or, uh, 
the, the subject and object of the relation as well. Um, so basically what you're trying to create is sort of an equivalence class of for uh, co-referent relations or co-referent entities such that they have the same labels and the same relations. And these are the rules that sort of enforce that intuition. Okay. Um, and finally, we'll, we'll look at these ontological rules. So um, we look at sort of different classes of ontological rules. One is inverse, so um, if R exists between uh, E1 and E2, then S exists between E2 and E1. Uh, selectional preferences, saying that if E1 uh, and E2 have a relation R, then we know E1's label is, you know, L1, and E2's label is L2. Uh, it was separate rules for them, but basically saying the, the label of the domain of relation, the label that corresponds to the range of relation. Um, subsumption, if, you know, label P is the parent of label L, so if, you know, um, if scientists are people, then we, and we know E is a scientist, then we know E is a person. Um, and we can do the same thing with, uh, with relations. We can say a relation such as, you know, leads, uh, uh, you know, leads or control, uh, or leading a, a group is the same as controlling a group or, um, have sort of a, a hierarchy amongst the relation types. Um, and finally, there's mutual exclusion. So if L1 and L2 are mutually exclusive labels, such as bird and country in this example, then being a bird means that you are not uh, a country, and vice versa. And we can do this with the relations as well. So I didn't want to know you said that the algorithm scales with uh, the of the yeah. Is it the cardinality of the rule set or the ground rule set? The ground rule set. The ground rule set. Yes. Because that would be like Oh, definitely, yeah. So you, you can define a small set of rules and have, in this case, we have tens of millions of grounding. So it's not that, um, you know, it's not that it's, it's not uh, data dependent, but it's sort of, uh, if you can think of all of the data dependencies, I feel like, Scaling with the number of ground rules is probably about as good as you can do. I was thinking about comparing it to uh, combinatorial sort of MCMC exploration. Right, and in the evaluation, we we, we actually do. Okay. Uh, so the, the the baseline we compare or the the competing method we compare against is the is an MLN, and that uses MCMC uh, to estimate the parameters or estimate the the result. So. I'm assuming, um, at least based on what I'm saying so far, is that the uh, theoretical complexity is about the same. Right? Should be one Between same. combinatorial optimization? Um, no, so this is much faster. So the, the problems that you can run this on are you know orders of magnitude larger than what you can run an MLN on. Because just think of all of the, to, to, to sample from the space, um, it's actually a very large space, right, of all the possible variables. And so if you don't have a, you know, if you're looking at something like a knowledge graph with, you know, tens of millions of possible states, um, sampling from that space is actually very hard. And in sort of the conversations we've had with authors, um, of the computing work it can take, you know, minutes to an hour for problems which take us 10 seconds to run NPSL, so. Okay, so let's, let's sort of reinforce this. Uh, we looked at sort of a, a picture or a sort of a schematic of the, the graphical model earlier without uh, labeling the rules, but now we can sort of assign a, sort of a potential function to each of these relationships in the, the graphical model. So uh, if you look at phi1, um, so at the top it's sort of a, a candidate label from the structural extractor saying that Kyrgyzstan is a bird, and that's actually uh, providing a potential to the label that Kyrgyzstan is a bird. Uh, the second is a, a candidate relation from the pattern extractor saying that um, the Kyrgyz Republic is located in Asia, uh, and you can see how that is uh, connected to the, the, the actual fact that the Kyrgyz Republic is located in Asia. Uh, the third potential we're looking at is the entity resolution, uh, P3, and that's saying that if the Kyrgyz Republic is a country, then Kyrgyzstan is a country, and so you can see uh, where, where we label that right there, phi3. And um, finally, phi, or, oh, I, 
uh, few four is a domain potential, and it's saying that uh, because the because the Kyrgyz Republic is located in Asia, then the Kyrgyz Republic is a, a country. Uh, so you can see phi four right here that between the relation and the label. And finally, phi five says phi five says that uh, bird and country are mutually exclusive labels, and it relates the facts. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is a bird, and Kyrgyzstan is a country. And there are you know, a number of other potentials which aren't labeled, but you can imagine what they are. You can work, work out what they are. Um, and so each of these potentials is going into, again, the, uh, the probability distribution. Each of those examples we saw is one of the ground rules that goes into the probability distribution. And now we're going to choose the values of the labels and relations that maximize this probability distribution. Um, and they maximize it by lowering the distance to satisfaction of each rule. Okay, so this is sort of the key to ha understanding how PSL works and how a model like this can be optimized. So we're very quickly going to look at some experimental results, and then I'll do. We'll take a little break, and I'll do the demo. Okay. Maybe it should be the break. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So maybe we'll just start with the demo after the break, and then go to the results. We'll see. Okay. Alright, so we we can mean at eleven fifteen. Do you think that would give you enough time to do that? Yeah. My computer besides the screen. <laughs> Yeah, 